Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Three Fates Decide. My name is Liz, and I'm with my two co-hosts, Sam and Mary. Say hi. Hi. Hello. Okay, so in this episode, we are going to talk about one of the recent or, you know, relatively recent hits on Netflix, Queen Charlotte, A Bridgerton Story. You think you know what we're going to talk about. And welcome back to Three Fates Decide. It just sounds more dramatic that way. All right. So this week we are going to be talking about... But just when you least expect it, we changed the game. One Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. I mean, we always celebrated Easter. Here's part of the Half-Blood Prince. So we're going to do another free talk, freestyle thing. No planned discussion. At the end of the day, only one thing matters. We decide. But we're going to hit the, the, the main highlights. That is the thing that we were saying back in that episode. A quick recap. Three Fates Decide podcast. So it is a six episode limited series that is um, an offshoot of the Bridgerton series, which has done very well on Netflix. Um, was one of their, their top 10 shows whenever they release a new season, and we are currently waiting for season three. So, question of the episode, what did you guys think of it? I liked it. It actually turned into my favorite of the uh, of the series. I mean, obviously, it's a separate thing. It's like a spinoff, kind of. So, I obviously, I do like Bridgerton. I loved the first season of Bridgerton. I even read the book. And... Uh, I liked the second season of Bridgerton, not as much as the first. And then this, I think, even surpassed the first season of Bridgerton. So, so far, it's been my favorite. And I think part of the reason why is because it's its own entity and it's semi based on true facts. Uh, So and, you know, obviously the queen became a prominent character in the series not a prominent character in the books in fact she's not even mentioned in the book but the second season she you kind of saw you know the first season she was almost like a comic relief type of thing and then the second season while she still kind of had that you kind of got to see another side of her when king george came in and he was kind of you know out of it and all over the place and you you saw her be different and the fact that they decided to take that and turn it into this series and explain kind of why she was the way that she was. It, I just thought they did a very good job uh, with it. And the end made me cry. But again, I'm a basket case. So there you go. I'm always a basket case. So don't feel bad, Sam. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I will admit I did not get through all six episodes because God, my life is like nuts. But <laughs> the episodes that I did watch, I liked. I did like it. I'm like Sam. I liked the first ep- the first season of Bridgerton so well that I bought the book. I have yet to read the book, mind you, but I did buy it. <laughs> Too many other books I need to read. Good lord. But uh, I I I liked the character of Queen Charlotte. I enjoyed her character in the two se- the two seasons of Bridgerton. So to see her. Um, basically become who she becomes. And you get to see how Lady Danbury becomes who she becomes. Mm-hmm. And um, you even see how Viscountess uh, Violet Bridgerton becomes Viscountess Violet Bridgerton. You know, for the to a, to an extent, you you meet her at least. In the third se- the third episode, I know you meet her. And that's about where I've got to. <laughs> I only got halfway through it. I mean, I got through all, all the first three episodes. I didn't get through the other three yet. I just want okay. to say, my, my, I've added to my uh, everyday, like, vernacular, uh, you know, sorrows, sorrows, prayers. Like, I just want to say it all the time. <laughs> I will admit, like there were some, uh, there were, yeah, there were like some good uh, gems in there in the scripts. Yeah. Lots of quotable quotables. 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> that would the, the, the sorrow, sorrows, prayers, prayers may end up having to go into a fanfic of mine. Yeah, you know, at like point. at some point, it's going to make it in there some way. Yeah, I mean, like there's just like certain you know bits of dialogue and things that are just so good and so repeatable you just can't help it and it becomes a thing so who knows maybe this could turn into it another one of those yeah yeah well people are wondering if they're going to do a second season but based off of where it where the season ends um and i guess I'll say now spoiler alerts with this episode. Probably should have mentioned that Is earlier. Okay, spo- spoil me, I don't care. But you know, <laughs> so if you haven't watched it, spoiler alerts. But uh the end of the series is when they find out that they're gonna have an heir, which turns out in real life is Queen Victoria. But in real life, Queen Charlotte doesn't get to see uh Queen Victoria's birth. So it's like, if they do another season, is it like going to go into where Queen Charlotte dies? Or are they going to ignore that and just have her continue be that secondary character throughout Bridgerton? That is the question. I suspect that they'll probably do just make her a secondary character. I don't think they'll do another since it was a limited series. Yeah. They usually don't. They usually don't make the make second seasons out of limited series. Usually. Right. Right. And well, to be honest, um, if I mean, what else could they really say, you know, because the way because like in the flashback parts, because like I mean, in essence, with this series, it's like two parallel stories Uh happening, like what happened, you know, 20 odd years earlier and then what's quote unquote present day. So it's like. What exactly more is there to tell that they need to explore, you know, in the flashback storyline part, you know, of a hypothetical season two, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, wouldn't that just be, in essence, repeating some of the same ideas you already did, except more babies (laughs) in your lives, you know? So, you know, it's it's like it's a little redundant, that kind of thing. So, yeah, but I, um, see, I think it's going to play into season three of Bridgerton. Yeah, that would that would make a little bit more sense. I think that's what's I think that's how it's going to happen, because since we found out that they're expecting an heir at the end of the limited series. So I think when season three of Bridgerton premieres and and is is gone that'll be in like um a theme that's like kind of like in the background of it Uh you know i don't think it's obviously not going to be the main theme because obviously you know the main theme is going to be penelope and colin but you know that's going to be like a background theme storyline that's happening you know what i mean right right so i i think that's how I think that's how they'll get away with not doing a second season of Queen Charlotte. Because really, Queen Charlotte was more to introduce her um, as when she became queen and how she, how they um, connected the ton Uh together, the two separate societies of the ton, and how they overcame the prejudices of color yeah between uh, to to bring them together to what we see in season one in season two you know of bridgerton right right no i think that and they they accomplished that in six seasons in six episodes so yeah no i thought they did uh, a really good job with that yeah i get yeah I could see that just kind of like continuing um, the the story throughout the Bridgerton series, um, I guess would make sense. Okay. Just don't kill yeah. her off, man. I know it happens in real history. Just don't do it. Let, let's just forget about it. 
just ignore that aspect. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so before I get to my general thoughts, um, I should point out to any newer listeners to our show that we actually did talk about season two of Bridgerton. We didn't do a separate episode on season one, though. I don't know if we want to do a, like a retrospective thing later on. Maybe, maybe not. But um, for any new listeners that aren't aware, we actually talked about season two back in episode 49, if you want to check that out. Um, okay, so out of the we talked about season one. I mean, we did talk about season one, like somewhat, but you know, the focus was mostly on two. I guess, like, we just kind of briefly talked about it. I I burned. I'm confused. (sighs) I burn for you too. (laughs) (laughs) But um, yeah. So okay, out of the three of us, I would be the one who is the book purist because um i may have i think i brought this up in that episode 49 i just mentioned but um actually i am one of those people who actually read the bridgerton novels like i started reading them when i think it was in between when books number three and number four were coming out because i do remember being like "Ooh, you know a book about colin penelope's coming out you know when you know it started showing up in the new york times bestseller list you know that sort of thing so i i started reading these these books at gosh like at least 15 years ago now maybe more than that so i was very attached to you know, the Bridgerton characters, which naturally you kind of feel that way, um, you know, when you read the books long before this TV series concept was even a thing, you know. So I will admit, I kind of went into Queen Charlotte with very low expectations, not because I think that it's going to be a bad series. I, you know, that's not why. It's because for any of you who have read the books or you are starting to read the books, you will probably notice that Queen Charlotte does not show up at the books in the books at all. So I kind of go in. So I kind of got went into the series, like, you know, the whole Bridgerton thing, just in general being like, you know, kind of like, eh, on the queen. I mean, I she like, don't get me wrong. She is like very entertaining. Uh, she's pretty funny in the scenes that she shows up in, but you know, I didn't, I just don't have an attachment towards this character, you know, because it's like I've been following, you know, the adventures of like Anthony and Benedict and all the all of them, you know, for like, like I said, like 15 plus years. So I'm more attached to those characters than a character that's in essence a TV only character, you know. So I was kind of like going into this feeling kind of meh about you know, the Queen Charlotte limited series. And keeping that in mind, I felt like I liked the series a lot more than I anticipated I would. Would I call it my favorite um, thing about Bridgerton, you know, the TV series universe overall at this point? I wouldn't say it's my favorite. But I, I did enjoy it. I, I do appreciate that they explored a little bit about um, what happened in the past and what leads up to what you saw in this alternative version of Regency England in season one of the main series. So, and I also, and like you guys were saying before, like I do like how you got a little bit of insight into lady danbury and a little bit into uh violet when she was younger i mean if anything actually i would have been way more interested in a lady danbury limited series over the queen but it sort of gave you yeah it really would be because um well this would be spoilers for the later books and the hypothetical later seasons of bridgerton but um yeah lady danbury does show up and has more of an impact on plots later. Um, 
So I was so I was actually more interested in like a limited series about her over the queen because again, you know, as a book reader, uh the queen doesn't ex doesn't really exist as a character at all. So yeah. But, you know, I I did end up liking this the series overall. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, and who knows, they could always do a, another, you know, separate limited series on, you know, um, Lady Danbury, Lady Danbury, or even Violet uh, Bridgerton, you know, like they could just do all yeah. separate, you know, um, because that was a, a whole nother thing too in this uh, yeah, thing. it would be it would be it would be really interesting to see Violet's uh, marriage. Yes, especially since that was a big topic. Um, yeah, when compared to Lady Danbury, Danbury's marriage. Yeah, you know, and and yeah. so I would love to see that the love that they had. Who knows? Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. you never know. The thing I do like is that right. the author of the books was very involved in the writing of this series, of this uh, thing too, this mini series. Right. So I did like that. So it still kind of kept it authentic, I guess, to everything. But I get what you're saying yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, um, actually, like it. You you kind of touched upon this just now, but like the funny thing is that like a coworker of mine is also a Bridgerton fan, and actually mm -hmm. she borrowed the novels from me because I'm because mm -hmm. just to show you like how long ago I started reading this, like this was back before I had an e-reader, so I physically own copies of the books. I do too. So she borrowed, yeah. So she borrowed them from me to you know kind of like read the future. Uh, seasons or you know at this point hypothetical seasons because Netflix has only greenlit three and four but I would imagine if three still has good numbers they they probably would at least give them you know five maybe six which would be great because let me tell you some of the later seasons like are in my just I mean my personal opinion I like some of the later books even more than season one uh, with Simon and Daphne, actually. I mean, if anything, if you were to ask me to rank the eight books, like which ones I like the most and which one I like the least, um, I have to admit Daphne and Simon are towards the bottom, not because I hate them, but it, it I, it's just like the other couples, I like them a lot more. <laughs> I can't lie. Um, but anyway, so she and I, so my coworker and I were kind of chit-chatting a little bit about, you know, Queen Charlotte. And she kind of agreed with me that, like, it would have been interesting to see a Lady Danbury series. And, you know, actually the way they wrote the character in the show makes it even more interesting to explore, like, her backstory more. Because you do get hints about, like, how she ended up marrying uh, her husband. You know, it's like one of those, like, arranged marriage type things. And you could see, like, there's an age gap between the two of them. So it's like, you know, child bride type of thing. Um, and it's also interesting, they introduced the concept that, like, their families were originally from Sierra Leone. And that they were actually pretty high status in Sierra Leone, but they're treated as second class citizens in England. So it would be kind of interesting to explore maybe that and also what Danbury does in the years after, you know, what happened in Queen Charlotte up to the present. Mm. So yeah. Yeah, there's a there's just a lot that would be very interesting to see overall that I think they could do, they should do a uh, different series. They, sh they should do different series on, especially since the original series has done so well for them. Right. You know, and Queen Charlotte has done well for them. So I think seeing them going back and seeing what 
other main characters from I shouldn't say main characters, but the main side characters of the original series, their backstories would be very, very interesting. Yeah. It would be. We shall see. I mean, I'd almost like to see the I would actually even like to see the Featheringtons. Yeah. (laughs) You know, like how they how their their story started. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that would be very interesting. Because I mean we we kind of see where it's going. I'd like to see how it started. How it started, how it's going. No. Yeah. Yeah. I should also mention this is a bit of an Easter egg that came up in Queen Charlotte is the fact that um so they mentioned there were obviously other families aside from the Danberries were given uh titles, noble mm-hmm. titles. Um the Smythe Smiths. Yes, the Smythe Smiths. They are a thing that not only is a recurring joke within the Bridgerton novels, but there's actually a four book series that Julia Quinn ended up doing about the Smythe Smiths exactly because they were so again for book readers they were such a popular running joke <laughs> in the novels because you know they're side characters that keep you know being brought up um as like a gag thing that readers kept asking her for years like are you are you going to do are you going to do like books about the those poor unfortunate Smythe Smith girls <laughs> and she kept saying no I wasn't planning to no I wasn't planning to but then eventually she was like you know what you asked for it I'm going to give it to you so she ended up doing like four books which I only read one of them and then I kind of lost track um and lost a little slight interest in it because I just got interested in other stuff but um but yeah um so you know I'm hoping in season three the Smythe Smiths do come up again as like a little bit more of a interesting amusing background characters because if they get some audience interest then who knows they could do spin-off ad- adaptations of those books too which I can tell you they're pretty funny. <laughs> Keep going until everyone gets tired of it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> we have ideas. So, Sandra, if you're listening, take notes. <laughs> Call us up. <laughs> Contact us. We got you. I mean, well, I mean, like, to be fair, you know, since this whole universe is based off of, you know, the Julia Quinn's books you got to give her tons of credit for not only coming up with like a really you know really thought out kind of you know universe but also um she writes like really funny funny books if you haven't if any of you listeners haven't read the books yet you really should because it's it's of course like you know regency you know period historical piece type romance novels which you know there's you know it's a whole thing it's like a whole you know subgenre in the romance you know genre but what i like about her is that like especially her later books they're they're pretty funny they are pretty funny and you know you almost get like a hint of um you know jane austen a little bit with some of the humor um because it's, you know, you, you just have these really funny characters and funny bits of dialogue and <laughs> crazy situations they get themselves into. <laughs> that, that, that's what kept me reading them for, like, years, you know, until my interest shifted. So, yeah. Quick synopsis of each episode type of thing? Yeah, if you, if you want to do that, sure. I mean, we could do, like, real quick. But basically, as someone mentioned... This is kind of like a two plot line mini series. Hmm. One in the current present Bridgerton, which is 1817, and then one when in 1761 when Charlotte is just meeting and marrying King George. And uh, again, some of the things that they have are actually somewhat historically accurate, and obviously most of it is uh, not. But. <laughs> Uh, so the first 
episode is called Queen to Be, and basically, who uh, is actually from Germany, her brother signs a contract for her to marry King George III. She's not happy and, you know, doesn't want to go through with it. And then upon seeing her and realizing that she is a woman of color, the king's mother, Princess Augusta, decides to invite several prominent people of color to the wedding and grants them titles, which we talked about, on her son's behalf. And it, it's kind of, uh, a, I don't know what, if, if I want to say like a test, but they're trying to see how it, how I guess the ton reacts to it. Um, you yeah, know, basically. So, but for the wedding, Charlotte tries to run away and wants to go over the wall. And she meets this guy who, you know, is trying to talk her out of kind of hopping over the wall. or And then she finds out that is George the Third. So she decides to stay and get married. And they have the wedding. And she's actually, I think, kind of like excited, but, you know, nervous about her wedding night. And then... To her surprise, he decides, okay, you're going to stay here at Buckingham House and I'm going to leave and go to my own place in Kew. And she's, I'm going to live, live there. there. And I'm not going to tell you why. And when you ask me why, I'm going to get mad and then I'm going to disappear <laughs> into the night. <laughs> uh, and that's exactly and what, that's he, what does. he does. Uh, meanwhile, in 1817, again, present time Bridgerton, Queen Charlotte learns that her only legitimate heir uh, and her granddaughter, the Princess Charlotte of Wales, died in childbirth. And she's basically telling her survive other surviving 12 children that they need to stop playing games, get married and have children. Because if not, there will be no heir of England. And that is actually a true story, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, it, yeah, it so, was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, episode two, Honeymoon Bliss. Again, we go back to 1761. Charlotte spends most of her honeymoon alone. She's not allowed to go anywhere or do anything because they're on honeymoon. This is supposed to be the time that the king and queen are alone together and George is nowhere to be seen um even though she's technically not allowed she does invite uh Lady Danbury uh to tea and that's where Lady Danbury learns of Charlotte's ignorance when it comes to sex and decides to draw different positions for her and explain sex which was pretty funny um <laughs> meanwhile <laughs> The king's mother is desperate to know if they've consummated the marriage and uh, asks Lady Danbury to come and tries to pressure her into telling her. But Lady Danbury, uh, you know, decides to instead use her uh, leverage to pressure Princess Augusta into furthering supporting her and her husband with their new titles and all that. Meanwhile, also... Uh, Lady Danbury is very unhappy in her marriage because he's old and gross. And yeah, not going to go into all that, all of their issues, but yeah, it's gross. Um, and then um, George reveals to Charlotte that he left her on their marriage night because he was charting the transit of Venus. And he asks Charlotte for a redo. And they finally consummate the marriage. However, the following morning, she overhears a conversation between George and his mother. And she finds out he's hiding something from her. So she gets very upset. Or he's hiding his true self, as he said it. So she got very upset. <laughs> and that is episode two. Um, episode three called Even Days. <laughs> kind of funny. Um, so Charlotte and George are... They're not talking to each other, but in order to try and get Charlotte to get pregnant, they decide to have sex on even days. And they are very passionate about that. So they kind of go all over the place. Um, and then 
once Charlotte kind of sees that George ha- is very passionate for agriculture, she decides that she's just going to accept him for who he is, no matter what, and that she's going to be there with him and they're on the same team and all that stuff. Um, Lady Danbury's husband, in the meantime, decides he wants to host the first ball of the season, which is difficult again because they're people of color. So how the ton's going to react? No one's going to, you know, everyone basically says they're not going to come. Um, and then she, uh, Lady Danbury goes to Queen Charlotte and basically Charlotte and George decide they're going to go to the Danbury ball, which has everyone else going. And it turns out to be a uh, great success. Mm. And then Lord Danbury dies during sex that night. He was so excited. He obviously had like a heart attack or something. When I tell you he was old, he was old. Um, and then it ends with Charlotte waking up in the middle of the night to find out that George is just running outside, stripping naked to praise Venus. And she has to try and convince him to come back inside uh, the palace. And that's kind of when you, you get a, your first glimpse of what's going on with, with George. And I do have something to say about that whole thing with George, but I'll wait until after. Um. So the fourth episode, Holding the King, uh, basically focuses on George and what's going on with him. So it's all kind of like flashbacks leading up to, you know, now. Uh, But it flashes back to when his mother arranged George's marriage behind his back. And he was terrified because he can't control his issues. He has fits and mental breakdowns and, you know everything. Um, A Dr. Monroe suggests that there's really nothing wrong with him and his breakdowns are due to a lack of discipline. So, you know, I guess he, he comes up with a plan to try and help him. When George falls in love with Charlotte, he removes himself from her presence um, to follow the program set up by Monroe in order to break him of his issues. And once he's feeling better and he's missing Charlotte, he moves back in with her. He dismisses Dr. Monroe um, only to discover that Charlotte had decided to keep him as her physician because she didn't know what he was and what he was doing. So, you know, he's her physician while she's pregnant and her pregnancy winds up triggering a huge mental crisis for George. And that leads to him running out into night naked you know praising venus in the garden yeah of course you know what why wouldn't you uh, of course. <laughs> uh exactly five, uh, princess augusta learns that charlotte is pregnant and announces plans to move into buckingham house uh charlotte is not happy about that and decides to write to her brother and asks be taken home when he visits because she's not happy about anything her and George or she's upset about George's fits and everything she doesn't know what to do about it so she just wants to give up and go home I don't think anybody would blame her at that point oh so because of uh Lord Danbury's death normally you know in society in English society when you have a title and the male dies, the title moves on to his son. So the non-white members of the ton came to Lady Danbury to ask what's now going to happen with the title. Now that Lord Danbury is gone, is it going to go to her son? So uh, Lady Danbury goes to Princess Augusta with her son, and doesn't get a clear answer whether or not he's going to inherit his father's title or not. Um, Charlotte then visits Lady Danbury, and basically they talk about everything going on. She's encouraged to uh, assert herself and, and, you know, take control. She ends up confronting Monroe and saving George, and Lady Danbury begins... uh, daily walks with Lord Ledger and I'll get into that in a second and they eventually sleep together 
And then going back to the eight, uh, 1810, Charlotte decides, you know, the present time, decides to betroth two of her sons to eligible princesses without their permission, basically. Mm-hmm. They don't have a choice. And Violet Bridgerton uh, admits to Lady Danbury that she's sexually frustrated because she hasn't had sex since her husband died, basically. So she's now starting to have feelings and has not, can't do anything about it. But again, very funny part. Um, but Lord Ledger is actually Violet's father. So Violet's father had sex with Lady Danbury, and Violet doesn't know yes. about it. So that's a whole nother subplot. Thing. And then the last episode, mm-hmm. um, Charlotte and George yeah. reaffirm that they do love each other, and Charlotte gives birth to the baby, and, you know, everything is all happy. Uh, George is not able to appear before Parliament because he's still in, like, the middle of a fit from all, like, I guess the nervousness of baby and everything. So then there's rumors that he's not fit to rule. Come up with the whole thing that they're going to host a ball to celebrate this, their son's birth and show that George is a capable ruler. Mm-hmm. Um Charlotte's brother proposes to Lady Danbury, but she decides that she doesn't want to be married ever again. Uh, so she rejects him. And Charlotte tells Agatha that she's going to help her keep her title. Uh, Charlotte and Lord Ledger, I'm sorry, uh, Lady Danbury and Lord Ledger are done. Like they don't sleep together anymore, basically. Um, and we go back to the 1810s and Lady Danbury confirms Violet's suspicions that she did have a liaison and affair with her father and but they continue their friendship which I mean at this point why not it was how long ago so who cares and then the very last scene which is the part that made me cry right? basically like I had mentioned <clears throat> Charlotte gets confirmation that one of her sons and his wife and his wife are pregnant, and it turns out it's going to be Queen Victoria based on history. It would be Queen Victoria, and so she goes to Kew to see George, who's basically George is called Mad King George. If you look at history, he's Mad King George. They think he might have been like bipolar or something, which is what his fits are. So he's kind of off off mm-hmm. the rails. So she goes to him and he's not paying attention because he's in the middle of something. But in this previous episode, she saw that if she, he would hide under the bed and like that would almost like ground him. So she went under the bed. He went with her. And as they're talking and she's telling him that, you know, they have an air that they're going to be OK. They see each other, you know, he kind of like snaps out of it and it's like they see each other as their young selves again laying under the bed together and it just shows how much love that they really had and how you know one thing is like the kids all kind of like we're ganging up on on charlotte that she doesn't care about them all she cares about is the air or whatever everything that she's done all of her actions were for him because she loved him so much she did everything for him and it, and it did it made me cry because you know, she he would be looking at her, and it's old George looking at young Charlotte, and then vice versa. It was a very nice moment. And that's the end. <laughs> the end. Yeah. And, you know, like we said earlier in this episode, is that, you know, given the way they wrote the ending to this, it's like, what, you know, how, like, well, what is there to do a hypothetical second, you know, season if you will of queen charlotte i mean wouldn't yeah. you just be in essence like repeating some of the same themes the same oh. issues but yeah that scene did yeah. make me cry i was fine Basically. the entire time until that scene i'm just like sitting there and i'm like oh my god they love each other thinking about it it, it kind of makes me wonder if that's what it's like for 
couples where mm. somebody in the and, couple like, they have, like, that moment is of, dealing with like dementia yeah, or Alzheimer's. Where they kind of like come back. I can't think of what it's called, but clarity. Yeah. Yeah, the clarity. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's um. Oh, what is it called? Yeah. Uh, also, like my my grandma had Alzheimer's. And she had zero clue. I mean, she didn't know who I was. She lived mm-hmm. with us. Um, but she didn't know if I was her niece, her friend, her cousin, her anything. Um, but I just remember this one time mm-hmm. that she, lucid, that's the word I was looking for, um, that so my my grandma loved to sing, and she created a song for me. Yeah, when I was younger, and she used to sing it to me all the time. And here she is. I mean, she was like, you know, very heavily into mm-hmm. her Alzheimer's to the point she thought she was a little girl. She was looking for her parents. She had to go to school. Like she was a kid in her eyes, you know. And I asked her if she remembered the song. And she sang it to me. Yeah remembered it she, like it triggered something that she became lucid for even just a moment and was able to sing the song so it's like I can I can imagine it'd be something like that you know like where all of a sudden you just like get lucid for something triggers like Charlotte went under the bed that made him lucid go under the bed with her because that was a comfort zone for her for him so like that brought him back to being lucid enough that they could have that that moment and just looking at each other, it was like they were back to being those young people in love. I mean, you know, it, it it's kind of an interesting parallel, I guess mm-hmm. you could say, between their relationship and like their children, or at least the ones who did end up getting married, because it's like they started out as an arranged marriage. And somehow they made it work. Meanwhile, like for anybody now, for anybody who's not somewhat familiar with, you know, this part of the royal family, which yeah. incidentally, if you aren't already aware, this is in essence the same royal family that's currently ruling uh the United Kingdom. Um it's like you know the the you know, what we mentioned earlier, what uh, Sam mentioned earlier about how the Princess Charlotte of Wales passed away in one of the episodes. And she was like, in essence, like at the time, the heir to the throne um, after her father, who was Prince George, who is the Prince Regent. Hence, this time period is called the Regency. Um, it's kind of interesting because, like, for anybody who's not familiar with his marriage to his wife, um, I believe her name is Caroline, Princess Caroline, it's pretty infamous for how much they couldn't stand each other. Like, they really, they, they really couldn't get along, which is a big reason why they only had the one daughter, uh, Charlotte, and why it was, it's, it wasn't just a tragedy because of the fact that, like, oh, the heiress, the future queen, you know, tragically die in childbirth but like i got the impression from the limited my limited research was that like there was like you know some mutual affection you mm-hmm. know for their one child and she's gone you know it which which is very sad and you know it and it's like if their marriage is like any indication of like how you know some of his siblings marriages where it's like they they probably didn't weren't very happy with anything (laughs) with any of their marriages so it's kind of interesting to see how their parents you know ended up falling in love with each other and had all these kids together and you know their actual kids they it's so funny because like are pretty unhappy with their marriages but it's so funny because like they talked about how like some of the sons had children but they were legitimate so like she basically was like all right enough enough sleeping around enough partying like Go get married. Go now. And they were all like, but mommy, you're being mean. Yeah. (laughs) Why can't we marry the common women, the commoners that we're in love with? 
because yeah. you can't, unfortunately. I'm sorry. That's just nope. the way it is. Back then, <laughs> they didn't change them rules just yet. Yeah. Exactly. That but, that's basically yeah. it. Yes, like, Wasn't there like God. like they had like between them all they had like 50 illegitimate children or something? <laughs> so basically they were uh, breeding like rabbits. They I, just didn't breed like rabbits really with the joke, right women. <laughs> no, it I thought Nick uh Nick uh Cannon was bad. <laughs> like I mean, he's pretty bad, but he ain't that well. I know, There's right? Multiple men, though. So you know what? No, he's up there. He's in there. He's one. He's like them. Jesus, he he's up there. He is like them because I mean, there's there, there's multiple men with probably multiple women having multiple children, and then mm-hmm. you got him having multiple children Sorry. with multiple just women into my at head the same like, friggin' time. Like him. It's like Nick Cannon. Like he's just. But anyway. But no, I thought, yeah. uh, you know, I thought the acting <laughs> we was phenomenal. We di- India we Armatefio, and I am so sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but she played a uh, young Queen Charlotte. She was so good. Holy crap, she was so good. Like, yeah, like, uh, she's got such a bright future. I hope I see more of her in 21. things to come because she was just phenomenal really was uh and then Corey um uh, Malcrease definitely plays King George the third again phenomenal that he was able to you know perform those like my heart broke every time he would have like one of those fits or whatever so again I thought he was uh fantastic Golda uh Rochevel, who plays the adult or the older, excuse me, Queen Charlotte. I mean, she's been good in the two seasons of Bridgerton, and then obviously with this. And then um, Arsema Thomas, who plays young Lady Danbury. Again, phenomenal. The whole cast was phenomenal. Oh, one thing I also wanted to mention is we had a, a gay relationship, which was... You know, interesting to see. Mm-hmm. Oh, we did. Uh, we did. Bravo. You know, yeah. that they were able to. And it wasn't like the fact that the the first sex scene was a gay sex scene, but it was done very well. Everything was tasteful. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. It bravo was tasteful. Them. Obviously, we don't know if that's true. I'm sure it's not. Uh, but yeah. Oh, it does make me wonder what happened to Reynolds. We see Brimsley older. Where's Reynolds? Maybe right? we'll get an answer at some point. I don't know. Um, but the one know. thing I wanted to say was for King George the Third, again, in history he's known as yeah. Mad King George the Third, who's the king at the time of the American Revolutionary War, so we all know, Hamilton, he sings, you know, like the best songs of the, no, anyway. Uh, but technically his like fits and stuff didn't happen until later on. He didn't really show like this, where he was like young and like having like crazy fits or whatever, like that, that wasn't, really the case it wasn't until he was like a little bit older when when that started happening but again they kind of took liberties to make the drama yeah um but queen charlotte and king george iii they did love each other they were they had a very happy marriage so i mean in real life so i did like that they showed that but no i just thought i just thought it was very well done basically yeah I was just glad that they didn't try to make their relationship unbelievable. Especially for being an arranged marriage. And because a lot of times you'll that you'll find that when they do things like this, whether it be in books or in B in shows, that the arranged marriage they always were like, Yeah, they they're it's an arranged marriage, but they either 
loathe, loathe, loathe each other, or they're just like, all of a sudden, they're just lovey-dovey. And it's like, that's not realistic. I mean, yes, they had to kind of um, up the timeline a little bit into their relationship because obviously king and queen of the freaking country, mm -hmm. they have to consummate that marriage whether they actually are physically attracted to one another or not. You know, they have to have that to make the marriage legal, at least back in that that day that day and age. But I did like the fact that they didn't really they they kind of like they show the progression of their relationship somewhat in a kind of realistic manner. Like, yes, they they meet, they get married, they obviously consummate, and then they're trying to get in having have an heir, but they still don't necessarily like each other, even though they're constantly trying to have you know get her pregnant but but it comes in time well and i as you mentioned like even like her struggle when she saw what his secret was and his fits and stuff and she was having a hard time coming to terms with it and you had mentioned like that's a very realistic thing like you really can't blame her for feeling like that right Right. I mean, also, you know, it was pointed out she's she's a teenage bride. I mean, how do you expect somebody that young to know what to do? Especially when you've been keeping this a huge secret from her from her. I mean, like, you know, at least in the show, they were they basically said she was married pretty much the same day she showed up at the at the palace. So it's like, mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you cope with right. all of this when you're literally marrying a stranger you just yeah barely met like 30 minutes ago yeah i mean that that's very it's very difficult to come to terms with those facts i mean like i said obviously they had to kind of rush right. that timeline of getting to know one another like we do like most people do now you get to know one another you fall, you fall in love then you get married they had to get married start having sex to consummate the marriage to make the marriage legal and valid for Everybody's protection at that point. I mean, honestly. Mm -hmm. But she still didn't. She still wasn't in love with him at that time. <laughs> and he sure as hell didn't love her. And then she sees what he's going through. She's like, there's something fucked up with this dude. What the hell's going on? But even though she says she sees that there's something wrong with him, she still cares for him because you can see her start to care for him. And she's trying to puzzle and figure out what's going on with him. And she's right. like, is this something that I can actually cope with for the rest of my life? Because this is my husband. I have no choice otherwise. But is this something I can cope with? Or what can I do to cope with it mm -hmm. in my own way while still giving care to this man that I am starting to care for, but I haven't fallen in love with just yet? But then, but then, obviously, you see they do fall in love. Uh, I mean, obviously, they had like fifteen children together, or more. I don't really know. They had a lot of children, <laughs> oh, a ridiculous yeah. amount of children. But yeah, no, you know, so obviously, basically, the rule of thumb is: I'm glad I wasn't you know, around that that time and royal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be both. I mean, I still remember there was that scene. Well, there, there was a couple of different scenes, but like there was that scene where like she was like confronting him at his observatory, and she's like venting her frustration about how like you know she's been basically alone the entire honeymoon period at that point, and she's completely frustrated that like you know it's like I'm supposed to be your wife and. I'm trying to get to know you because, you know, we're basically, in essence, stuck with each other for the rest of our lives. So I'm trying to, you know, understand you and get to know you. And yet you're staying away from me. And it's, you know, very disconcerting. I mean, like, who wouldn't feel that way? You know, you're, you're, you're trying to get to know someone. You're trying to, you know, meet halfway 
with this person who's supposed to be your partner and they're being difficult about it for some mysterious reason that you don't know. And I was like, wow, you know, this, this is, this is so real. This is so true. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, obviously people nowadays don't go through anything remotely that dramatic, but you know, I'm sure for a lot of people, there's, there's always that point in a relationship you're in where you may be feeling very frustrated with your partner because they're blocking you off for some reason and you're trying to understand why, you know, you're keeping me out of your life in essence, you know, so that I, that, that was like so real and so true. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, to close out, um, I, I I don't know about you two, but I can't wait for season three because I'm curious uh, <laughs> how that's going to turn out, given how season two ended. Yeah, especially since it's it's a different book, and then also just even hearing the like, you know, little things about how like they were doing rewrites and stuff. So I'm definitely interested. Well, yeah. I think it's interesting that they technically are skipping Benedict and going straight to Colin. Because of the way season two ended, they kind of they they kind of had to skip poor Benedict. <laughs> well, I mean, I think from my understanding, they're they're basically swapping the order, right? You know? I mean, they'll bring Benedict in in, in season four, but it's just like I was like, I understand mm-hmm. why they did it, but I'm like, man, because they were because it's supposed to be one book per child, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of hoping that obviously, you know, season three, the main focus is obviously Colin and Penelope. But what I do hope is that they're doing some setup for season four as well, because, um, again, I'm not going to spoil what happened in that book for anybody who hasn't read the book. But let's just say that, you know, the way that book was written, it's like there's time skips in it to a certain degree it's like certain events happened you know this you know in a particular year and then two years later this other thing happened you know the rest of the book happens so it's like i'm kind of hoping that like there's some kind of setup happening in season three otherwise it may feel a little odd um Mm -hmm. in season four so just you know because again, without spoiling what happened in the book, that that's how it that's how it's written. So it's kind of like I hope there was some setup <laughs> happening, but who knows? We'll find out. Did you like what you heard on our episode today? Well, then feel free to come back and listen to us again. You can find us on all different streaming sites, including Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Deezer, iHeartRadio, Spotify. You name it, we're there. And if you really like us, feel free to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Three Fates Decide. That's T H R E E Fates Decide. You can also email us at Three Fates Decide at gmail.com and check out our website at Three Fates Decide.com to find other episodes, information about your three hosts, and all of our other links. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time on Three Fates Decide.